So see, uh, the, the point is that uh, you know we are trying to look at families of meromorphic functions, we are trying to look at uh, uh, trying to look at normally convergent families of meromorphic functions. The reason is because you want to do topology on the space of meromorphic functions okay? and uh, because that is the kind of uh, uh, you know setup that you need to be able to prove uh, big, the big Picard theorem and the little Picard theorem. Okay. So, uh, now the, so you know let me, let me briefly you know uh, remind you, uh, if you take inspiration from topology alright, uh, what is the topology that you will put on the space of functions? Normally if you have a topological space and you have, you are looking at real valued or complex valued functions, then you will restrict yourself to continuous bounded uh, real valued or complex valued functions uh, that is uh, that is a Banach algebra and uh, it is also a topological space it is complete uh, as a metric space the metric is induced by a norm and the norm is essentially uh, convergence in that norm is actually equivalent to uniform convergence. Okay. So, the moral of the story is that uh, if you are going to take inspiration from topology okay, then trying to do topology trying to do topology on the space of functions is the same as do studying uh, functions under uniform convergence. Okay. Now this is this is topological, so that means that you are only worried about continuous functions. Okay. But now suppose you come to complex analysis, okay. then you are worried about holomorphic functions uh, or uh, analytic functions okay. and we are worried about something even worse, we are worried about meromorphic functions which are actually which have the additional problem that they can have poles at finitely many uh, at, at, at a set of isolated points okay. uh, and of course finitely many if uh, your domain is compact uh, is the whole uh, uh, Riemann sphere or the extended plane. So, if you are looking at uh, say holomorphic functions on a domain, okay, a domain in the complex plane or a domain in the external complex plane that does not matter, suppose you are looking at the analytic functions or holomorphic functions on the domain and you want to do topology on that set of functions. Okay. Uh, mind you we have already seen that uh, the set of functions it is a ring in fact and then uh, if you look at uh, uh, meromorphic functions it is a field. Okay. Uh, it has algebraic structure but we are now worried about the topology. Okay. So, you want to do topology on the set of uh, uh, analytic functions on a domain or you want to do uh, more generally topology on the set of meromorphic functions on a domain which means analytic except for poles. Then you know if you try to draw inspiration from topology you would just say that you this is the same as studying them under uniform convergence okay. because topologically uniform convergence uh, uniform convergence corresponds to convergence in the space of functions. Okay. But if you do it, if you come to the uh, case of analytic functions, okay, this is not this is not the right thing because you don't get uniform convergence. So I was trying to explain to you last time 
that for example if you take the uh, geometric series you take the functions that correspond to partial sums of the geometric series okay then they are of course polynomials and they converge absolutely in the unit disk to the sum of the geometric series is which is 1 by 1 minus the variable okay so the geometric series is 1 plus z plus z squared and so on where z is a variable and you are restricting z to be in the unit disk that means you are making mod z less than 1 then 1 plus z plus z squared and so on that converges uh, to 1 by 1 minus z that is a good that is a high school formula for geometric series now the point is that this convergence is absolute on the unit disk there is no problem about that but it is not uniform on the whole unit disk okay that was that was something that I told you I asked you to check it as an exercise I hope you have done it it is very easy to do the convergence is not uniform on the whole unit disk it is only uniform on compact subsets of the unit disk okay so you do not get convergence but you get un, you, you do not get uniform convergence but you get only normal convergence so the moral of the story is that when you want to do topology on a space of holomorphic functions you should not look at them under uniform convergence you must look at them under normal convergence so that is the first uh, you know that is the first moral uh, first lesson to be learnt that is what you should keep uh, at the back of your mind so that is one thing so you know uh, more generally if you want to uh, extend this uh, to meromorphic functions things are more complicated because now you have poles okay and uh, the the other thing is that of course you know uh, uh, by going from uniform limits to normal limits things are going to be good okay because no, normal convergence is just uniform convergence on compact sets okay it is weaker than uniform convergence as it is okay but it is good enough for our purposes because uh, as I told you in the last lecture if you have a sequence of holomorphic functions which converge normally to a limit function then that limit function is also holomorphic okay this is something that I explained last time okay uh, essentially it uses uh, you know Cauchy's theorem and Morera's theorem okay and the fact that analyticity is or holomorphicity is a local property. So uh, therefore uh, there is no harm in uh, relaxing uh, the condition of uniform convergence to the condition of normal convergence which means uniform convergence only on compact sets okay and I also told you philosophically why that is good enough for complex analysis because the moment you say uniform convergence on compact sets you get uniform convergence on closed disks because they are also compact and therefore you get uniform convergence on sufficiently small open disks okay that is good enough for the analysis for the for the for the for the differentiation theory and then for the integration theory also it is good because whenever you integrate on a contour the contour is a compact set therefore you will get uniform convergence on the contour okay so that helps in the integration theory so for all practical purposes uh, uniform convergence on compact sets that is normal convergence is good enough okay so that is what we we are going to we, we have to worry about now the the other important thing that uh, uh, I want to tell you is that you see at least if you are working with meromorphic functions you know the meromorphic functions have poles okay so at a pole the, the function is going to behave uh, in a bad way in the sense that the modulus of the function is going to blow up to infinity okay so that is for, for example that is one of the characterizations of a pole the limit of the function uh, as you approach a pole is going to infinity okay and uh, by that I mean limit goes to the point at infinity okay and of course here you are uh, using the uh, the topology on the extended complex plane uh, namely the complex plane with the point at infinity uh, given by the one point compactification which makes it homeomorphic to the Riemann sphere okay. Now uh, there is another pathology and that is the that is the pathology that I was trying to explain towards the end of the last lecture so the pathology was the following you take the exterior of the unit disk mod z greater than 1 z is our variable uh, we are on the z plane the complex plane and you are taking the exterior of the unit disk mod z is greater than 1 and what you are doing is you are looking at these functions powers of z uh, you are looking at 1 which is z power 0 if you want then z and then z squared and z cube and so on okay now that is a sequence of functions 
and the point is that this sequence of functions you can see point wise it will go to infinity because since mod z is greater than 1 mod z to the n to the power of n that is going to go to infinity because it is uh, for a real number greater than 1 you know its higher powers will diverge to infinity. So, mod z so z power n is so the sequence of functions is going to converge point wise to the function to the constant function infinity namely it is a function that it which associates to every point the value infinity ok. So, you have to worry about this crazy function ok. So, you have to so this is a pathology that happens that that you will have to take care of and the point is that uh, therefore, we are forced to introduce a function called infinity ok. And this function infinity is what it is just the constant function infinity namely it is the function which maps every uh, value to infinity that is what it is. And then if you think of if you if you think of that as a function I mean it is a function of course, theoretically if you want it is a function from your domain to uh, the extended complex plane because after all in the extended complex plane infinity is a valid point ok it is it is it is an it is a member of that set. So, you can really think of the function infinity as the fun constant function with taking the value infinity provided you extend your values to not just complex values, but also the extended plane you include the value at infinity that is one thing. So, in that sense you can say that this sequence of functions f n of z is equal to z power n that converges to infinity you can say that. And when I say that converges to infinity I mean that it converges point wise in the exterior of the unit circle to the function which is infinity ok. So, you have uh, you have this very nice situation it is a very nice pathology you have these z power n's which are all holomorphic functions ok. In fact, they are entire functions they are just polynomials and they converge to the function infinity in the exterior of the unit disc the convergence is again a normal convergence it is uniform on compact sets ok. It is still a normal convergence it is not just a point wise convergence, but it is in fact even a normal convergence in a way I will explain to you. So, what is the moral of the story the moral of the story is you have a honest sequence of holomorphic functions you have a honest sequence of analytic functions which is converging to the function infinity normally that also happens you see this is the this is the extreme case that happens and this also has to be uh, taken care of in, in our arguments ok. And mind you if this is happening for uh, holomorphic functions it will happen also for meromorphic functions because you know holomorphic functions are very good the meromorphic functions are worse because they have poles. So, even for a family of holomorphic functions even for a family of analytic functions if you can get you normal convergence to the function which is infinity ok you should expect the same thing to happen also for meromorphic function. So, what I am trying to tell you is if you sum up all this if you want to study topology on the space of meromorphic functions first of all you must study it with respect to normal convergence ok. The second thing is you have to introduce this function uh, keep in mind this function which is the function infinity ok and then you have to do uh, you have to justify this the, this business of uh, uh, trying to uh, make sense of normal convergence ok and uh, so so let me so uh, so let me begin by trying to you know uh, explain at least in this particular case uh, where this normal convergence comes from ok so so let me write the let us let us do the following thing we will we will worry about we will worry about uh, 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 metrics on the plane and metrics on the extended plane which are transported from metrics on the Riemann sphere ok. So, so here is here is what I am going to do uh, so, so let me draw a diagram uh, I have this uh, so this is my this is my usual complex plane uh, well x y and uh, so this is my usual complex plane which is the x y plane. And then I have the uh, uh, well uh, you of course, you know we are we are going to uh, compare everything with the uh, stereo, uh, 
with the Riemann sphere using the stereographic projection. So, what I am going to do is let me draw this, let me draw this thing here uh, which is a Riemann sphere. So, this is supposed to be 1, this is minus 1 on the uh, on the x axis and here is my here is my sphere, uh, it is cross section uh, on the plane is the unit circle. So, it is going to be, so this is my Riemann sphere as it is and uh, then of course, I have this third axis which uh, I will not call as z, I will call it as u because z is supposed to stand, stand for x plus i y, okay. z is supposed to be x plus i y and well uh, and here is a north pole, okay. Suppose I start with 2 points z1 and z2 on the complex plane, okay. Uh, see what is, what are, what kind of distances can I uh, define on these, on these points what kind of metric can I define on the complex plane? There is a usual metric which is d of uh, z1, z2. So, I will put d sub e for the Euclidean metric and you know what that is, it is simply modulus of z1 minus z2, it is just the distance between these two points, okay. This is the good old metric that we use always in Euclidean space, right. Uh, it is actually the length of this line segment, okay, joining z1 and z2. Then the other thing that you can do is you can take these, uh, take the images of these points on the Riemann sphere because of the stereographic projection and you can measure the distance between those two points and call that as the distance between these two points. So, what you can do is, so here is a stereographic projection. So, P2 is this point here on the sphere which is uh, the unique point of intersection of the line joining N and Z2 on the sphere, okay. And similarly, P1 is the unique point on the Riemann sphere, uh, which is the intersection of the surface of the sphere with the line joining N and Z1, okay. And now you see P1 and P2 lie on the sphere. Now, what I can do is that I can uh, measure the distance between P1 and P2, okay. Now, that distance I am measuring in 3 space, okay, because now everything, once you draw the Riemann sphere, you are actually in R3 and uh, your R2, which is the xy plane corresponds to the complex plane, all right. So, what you could do is you could define this new, you could define the following new distance uh, uh, also d, uh, let me call this as d uh, uh, c for chordal distance. So, d c is the chordal distance uh, from z 1 and z 2, it is just length of the chord from uh, p 1 to p 2 where P1, the stereographic projection of P1 is Z1 and the stereographic projection of P2 is Z2, okay. So, this is another, uh, this is another distance that I can define. It makes, see what this distance does is that uh, actually it is the metric in R3. After all, uh, the chord joining P1, P2 is exactly the line segment from P1 to P2 in 3 space and I am just taking the length of that line segment. So, it is actually the metric in R3, it is metric in R3, okay. And so, it is a metric space. You know, you, whenever you have a metric on a space and you restrict to a subspace, then the subspace also becomes automatically a metric space. So, this, uh, this distance will make uh, uh, the Riemann sphere into a metric subspace of R3, okay. And uh, what we are doing is that through the stereographic projection, you are transporting that metric to the uh, to the uh, complex plane because after all the stereographic projection is a bijection between the extended complex plane and the Riemann sphere, okay. The moment you have a bijection of a set with a metric space, you can transport the metric on the metric space to the set. So, I have just transported the, uh, basically what I have done is I have simply transported the uh, uh, metric on R3 restricted to the Riemann sphere, <laughs> I have simply transported it to the plane, that is what this DC is. So, this d c also will d sub c that is also a metric you can check that and that also makes the complex plane into a metric space, okay. And, uh, uh, but, but, the, but the big deal is that you know uh, all these metrics are all equivalent, okay. Namely, the topologies that they induce on the complex plane they are all the same that is the whole point, okay. And, and that is very important because what it tells you is it tells you the following thing, if I want to study convergence of functions, you know <coughs> as long as you are worried about 
uh, continuous functions. I can use any of these metrics and the point is, uh, so let me say tell that in advance why I am worried about these extra metrics is because I can also define the distance of a point on the complex plane to the point at infinity, okay. Because that the point at infinity will correspond to a finite point namely the north pole on the Riemann sphere and that distance to that is something that I can measure, okay. So that is the advantage, the advantage is you see I want to be able to measure distance to the point at infinity, I cannot do it with the Euclidean metric because first of all the point at infinity is not in my set, okay. It is it is an extra point I have added for compactification and once I add this extra point I have to add this extra topology, the, the topology of the one point compactification but then I that is not enough I have to even make it a metric space and where will I get the metric structure? The only way is I will have to get this metric structure from uh, the Riemann sphere which is what is homeomorphic to the extended plane, okay. And therefore I am led to look at the uh, metrics on the Riemann sphere and so this is the caudal metric okay so uh, d sub c is a caudal metric and then here is a third metric which is the spherical metric so d sub s of z z1 comma z2 this is the uh, length of the arc of the minor arc from p1 to p2 along uh, this is the length of the minor arc from P1 to P2 along the uh, uh, great circle through P1 and P2. So you see this is a spherical distance. What is the spherical distance? You see the spherical distance actually I am, I am trying to measure distance on the uh, Riemann sphere on the surface of the sphere, so it is a curved distance, okay and I am trying to measure the shortest curved distance and you know you, you can imagine this if you uh, uh, basically what you what one is doing is that one is doing a kind of some kind of Riemannian geometry, what is happening is that you have a surface, okay you imagine some nice smooth surface you have two points, okay then you can try to connect those two points by many arcs, by many arcs. Uh, on the surface passing on the surface okay and then you then you can measure the lengths of each of these arcs and you can take the smallest length okay and the arc of smallest length is called a geodesic okay. So now what is happening is that if you take the sphere it is quite easy to see that the geo if you give me two points on the sphere on the surface of the sphere then the geodesic is exactly the following you for those two points you get a big circle a great circle a circle of largest radius on the surface of the sphere passing through those two po points and you take the minor arc okay any two points of a circle will split the circle into two arcs and you take the minor arc this one of smaller length and take the length of that that is exactly the spherical uh, distance okay and that is what I am denoting as d sub s it is a geodesic for uh, uh, the sphere for any two points on the sphere okay. So um, the great circles are the geodesics okay the minor minor arcs of the great circles are the geodesics for points on the sphere. So what is happening is that now I have all these three metrics the beautiful thing is that these three metrics give you metrics not only on the complex plane the point is they give you metrics on the extended plane okay. See what I have drawn here is for z1 and z2. Uh, imagining z1 and z2 as points on the complex plane but I can very well make z1 or z2 to be the point at infinity. Now when I say I make the point uh, z1 or z2 to be the point at infinity I cannot see it on the complex plane okay but I can see its image on the Riemann sphere it is the north pole. So basically what I am doing is I am simply taking two points on the Riemann sphere and I am measuring their distance the distance between them either the caudal distance or I am measuring the spherical distance. So the moral of the story is that this uh, these distances help you to give a metric on uh, the uh, extended plane and that the topology induced by all these metrics is one and the same all these metrics are equivalent okay. So this is a fact that you need to check from uh, you, you know uh, this is very easy in fact uh, to check uh, ideologically let me tell you how to do it. How will you check the two 
uh, two metrics uh, are equivalent for a topological space, it is very simple. What you do is that you show that you take an uh, you take a point for each point of the topological space, you take a small open ball uh, with respect to one metric and show that it contains a small open ball with respect to the other metric and do this for both metrics symmetrically and then you are done. Okay. So, you can see uh, pictorially you can see that that is true okay, for all the 3 metrics. So, therefore, all these 3 metrics will give you one and the same topological space structure on the extended complex plane which is the same as the uh, one point compactification and that will be exactly homeomorphic to the uh, ex to the Riemann sphere by the stereographic projection. Okay. And the advantage of doing all this, why do all this? You can ask me why do all this? The advantage of doing all this is that now I can say, now I can make sense of the following statement. A sequence of f functions f n converges normally to infinity to the function infinity. It makes sense now because I can say I can say convergence with respect to this metric one of these metrics uh, namely the second and the third one which are also defined for the point at infinity okay? and that is that is the reason why we need to use that. Okay? So, let me write this uh, down uh, all the uh, so, so let me write some somewhere here. Uh, maybe in a maybe use a different color uh, all all the uh, metrics below are equivalent on c all right and uh, the last two metrics are equivalent on the extended plane the last two are uh, or the latter the, la the latter two so let me uh, let me make some space let me get rid of this the latter two namely these two are equivalent on the extended plane c union infinity Okay. And of course, so so I rubbed off z equal to x plus i y. So let me write it here. Okay, and now here comes the uh, here comes our uh, uh, the advantage of this. Uh, we can now say that uh, f n is if n of z equal to z power n, n greater than or equal to 1 converges normally to infinity on mod z greater than 1. You can say this, you can make this statement, it makes sense. Okay. And, uh, and why is that correct? Uh, you have to do a little bit of uh, uh, you know why I am spending so much time on this is because you see this normal convergence to the function which is infinity is something that is uh, hard to uh, as it is if you do not analyze it, it is very hard to uh, digest. Okay. So, it is very important that you understand what is happening here and you, you must understand that uh, therefore, even if you are looking at uh, normal convergence of uh, you know honest holomorphic analytic functions you can still end up with the function at the function which is infinity okay so you see what is happening see uh, uh, so here is so again let me um, so again let me draw another diagram so you see here is the here is your complex plane as it is uh, in r2 and uh, this is the origin and of course i have uh, so let me draw the riemann sphere here Okay. So, this is the situation and you see uh, uh, of course, mod z greater than 1 is this uh, is the region of the plane exterior of the unit circle. Okay. So, basically uh, so, so, so this is mod z greater than 1 uh, oops yeah it is very hard to draw that and in a, in a 3 dimensional diagram. So, um, 
let me do the following thing let me use another color you know I'm, I'm just looking at so it's all these uh, so it's this exterior of this unit circle on the on the complex plane which is thought of as the xy plane okay and of course you know the third axis is uh, I'm calling it as u now uh, you see uh, so let me change color again so I have this let me draw this also so that this is u and uh, I have the north pole here okay um, now you see see this the, the these these red lines that I have drawn they are supposed to uh, extend outside the unit circle uh, to the whole exterior of the unit circle and what they are going to give me uh, they are going to give me this domain mod z greater than 1 if you consider it as a domain in the extended plane it is a it is a neighborhood of infinity okay and what is its image under the uh, stereographic projection it is exactly the upper hemisphere okay it is the whole upper hemisphere which is which you can see clearly is a neighborhood of the north pole okay that is what that is the region you are looking at all right. Now you see take a compact subset of mod z greater than 1 take a compact subset it is a closed and bounded subset of mod z greater than 1 okay uh, and so you know if you are looking at a compact subset on the plane okay then uh, any compact subset in mod z greater than 1 on the plane has to be has to lie within a sufficient sufficient uh, sufficiently well chosen annulus okay it should lie within an annular region consisting of an inner circle and an outer circle centered at the origin sufficiently small inner radius greater than 1 and sufficiently large outer radius greater uh, than of course the inner radius okay so you see if i if you if i take some compact set here so here is some compact set k compact set in 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 the complex plane then you see this k of course lies inside uh, a, a suitable annulus so it's going to it's going to look like this you know i'm going to get something like this i'm going to get i'm going to get this annulus here uh, so i'm going to get this annular region mind you this is the annular uh, region on the complex plane consisting of uh, the uh, region between uh, these two circles and I am also including the boundaries to make it compact okay. So it is a closed and bounded set it is compact and this is a compact set and uh, the point I want to make is that uh, instead of just considering any compact set k in the complex plane which is lying in this domain mod z greater than 1 it is enough to just consider such uh, annuli which lie in the exterior of that circle okay the exterior of the unit circle and you see if you watch carefully uh, how is this annulus going to be given by well this annulus is going to be given by mod z less than small r uh, I mean less than capital R uh, less than or equal to capital R less than or equal to small r which is greater than 1 this is how it is going to be where small r is the radius of the inner circle uh, capital R is the radius of the outer circle okay this is what this annulus is going to be given by and uh, well what is its image going to be on the uh, Riemann sphere under the stereographic projection I am going to get this I am so I am going to get something like this here this is what I get I will get a curved annular region centered at the north pole all right and now you see uh, uh, now you see that uh, now you can see why uh, the uh, fn converges to the function infinity uh, normally okay because our definition of convergence is in the following sense okay so the the so the definition of convergence will be of course point wise convergence okay but then uh, point wise convergence uh, if you try to write it in the metric it will create a problem when you put the point at infinity okay so I cannot say that uh, for each point z uh, z naught 
f n of z naught converges to infinity uh, as n tends to uh, 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 as n tends to infinity I cannot say that I can say that in a uh, uh, topological sense okay, but I cannot say that in a metric sense but if I use Euclidean metric but then if I use a spherical metric I can I can say that okay. So, the moral of the story is that if you look at the uh, uh, if you look at the distance the spherical distance between uh, a, a, a point z in uh, uh, I take the point z in k my compact set okay. If I look at the spherical distance between uh, uh, f n of z which is in this case z power n okay and the point at infinity okay and here you see uh, what I mean here is infinity of z. See infinity of z I am thinking of the function which is constant function which gives the value infinity to every point. So, I am what I have written there is actually infinity of z so, and I am saying that the spherical distance between f n of z and infinity of z that can be made uniformly less than epsilon irrespective of z if I choose n sufficiently large. So, I can make this less than epsilon okay, for n greater than or equal to capital N irres irrespective of so, uh, so given uh, if I start with an epsilon greater than 0 okay, for z in k I can make the spherical distance between f n of z which is z power n and infinity I can make it less than this epsilon for n whenever small n is greater than or equal to a large n large enough n such a large enough n exists the point is that this large enough n does not have anything to do with this z it will work for all z in the compact set that is the uniformness that is the uniformness of the convergence on the compact set. So, so n this n is so there exists this n and this is independent of z and you see uh, this is th this fact is true this fact is very uh, you see suppose I give you an epsilon okay uh, what is the spherical distance between f n of z and infinity it is actually the spherical distance between z power n and infinity all right and z power n is going to lie where it is going to lie in uh, uh, well mod z power n is going to lie in, in this annulus okay and you know uh, if uh, you see if I this is the, the, the inner radius of this annulus is r power n small r power n the outer radius is capital R power n and you know if I uh, and since r is greater than 1 if I increase n r power n is small r power n itself is going to shoot up okay. So, moral of the story is that this uh, uh, this region if I take its image in the on the Riemann sphere what I am going to get is a, a sufficiently small annular region surrounding uh, the north pole and it clearly the spherical distance can be made less than epsilon for any point in that region. Okay. So, that is you know that is uh, pictorial justification for this statement. So, moral of the story is now you know you are able to justify that this sequence z power n converges normally to the function infinity okay, uh, on the exterior of the unit disc in the uh, in the extended plane okay. and the point is that you are using the spherical metric. Okay, that is the advantage you are using the spherical metric because it allows you to uh, give you uh, to, to, to measure the point uh, distance even to the point at in infinity from a finite point in the complex plane which you cannot do with the usual Euclidean metric. And the way all this is done uh, it will also it will also extend the usual definition of normal convergence. See suppose you have a sequence of analytic functions which converges to a honest analytic function itself okay a finite valued function a, a function that does not take values infinity. Then what is the usual convergence that we talk about the usual convergence that we talk about when you for example when you do a first course in complex analysis the usual convergence that you talk about is with respect to the Euclidean metric okay you are only worrying about the Euclidean metric nobody is worried about the point at infinity uh, to begin with okay 
Now, uh, if you take a usual uh, a honest sequence of holomorphic functions on a domain, analytic functions on a domain, suppose it is converging normally again to uh, an analytic function on that domain, okay. Then suppose this convergence is in the usual sense, I am saying this convergence is also correct with respect to the spherical metric. The reason is because the spherical metric when you restrict it to the usual complex plane it is equivalent to the usual Euclidean metric, so you do not lose anything. So, what I am saying is that this definition of a sequence of functions converging to another function normally on a domain that works uh, irrespective of uh, whether you are using the Euclidean metric or whether you are using the spherical metric, but the point is it helps you uh, when uh, infinity values are taken you it, it helps you because when infinity values are taken you cannot use the Euclidean metric you can use only the spherical metric ok. So, the normal convergence under the spherical metric is just an extension of the normal convergence under the Euclidean metric, they are this as far as uh, a subset of the complex plane is concerned convergence under this spherical metric is the same as convergence under the uh, Euclidean metric, normal convergence under the spherical metric is the same as normal convergence under the Euclidean metric because they are uh, they are equivalent ok. So, so this is one point that you uh, need to understand. So, you know so let me say this, uh, so let me write this specifically we need to therefore, uh, uh, worry about uh, by that I mean include we need to worry about that is include the function the function infinity that takes the value infinity at, at every point. of your domain, then uh, we need to define, uh, we may define normal convergence as follows. Let f n be a sequence of holomorphic functions. or analytic holomorphic is the same as analytic uh, functions on a domain t in the complex plane we say uh, f n converges converges to f uh, on d normally ok if uh, the spherical distance uh, between uh, f n of z and f of z goes to 0 unif normally which means uniformly on compact sets on D where we allow Uh, f to be uh, the the function infinity. This is this is an exceptional case. Okay, so you, you define normal convergence in the following way. So what is the normal convergence? You have a sequence of functions on a domain in the complex plane. You say f n converges to f on the domain. Okay. Uh, if the spherical distance okay, that converges to 0. Okay. Mind you uh, 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 this spherical distance is a function of z, so z is varying on the domain. So, I want you to understand this z is varying on the domain. This, uh, this, this quantity here <coughs> that is a uh, this quantity here is also a function of z it measures uh, for each z 
it measures the spherical distance between f n of z and f of z ok and what I want is that function of z should go to 0 the constant function 0 uniformly in z on compact subsets of z uh, of, of, your, of the domain. So, I want it to go to 0 normally on the domain that is my definition and now uh, the beautiful thing is uh, you know we need this definition because if you take the domain as I told you if you take the domain to be mod z greater than 1 and you take f n of z to be z power n such a definition is necessary. So, what it tells you is that now you have to also worry you are not worried only about uh, functions which uh, take complex values you have to also allow functions take the value infinity but then notice if you take the value infinity if you allow functions take the value infinity then you can include meromorphic functions because you can define the value of the meromorphic function at a pole to be infinity and the beautiful thing is the very same definition this very same definition works absolutely well if you change holomorphic by meromorphic. So, that, that is because of a certain symmetry uh, rotational symmetry that is there uh, about for the spherical metric that I will explain in the next lecture. But the point is uh, so the important observation is that this same definition works with holomorphic re replaced by meromorphic and that is all that we need to do all the analysis we want ok. So, I will stop here.